Hey guys, welcome to the Biomechanics 1 video series looking specifically at angular motion. This particular series of videos is divided into four equal parts. The first one looks at angles and the definitions of degrees and radians. The second looks at angular velocity. The fourth looks at angular acceleration. The, sorry, the third looks at angular acceleration. And the fourth and final one looks at the link between angular and linear quantities of motion. So linear quantities we've looked at in previous videos, and this one specifically de dedicated to the angular equivalence. In the first video that we're busy doing right now, uh, we're introducing this concept of a radian. So if I have circular motion or angular motion that tends to occur, if I have this length, some length or some radius, um, of the circle that would ultimately circumscribe the distance around it. If there's an angle that is formed where this arc length, right, this distance on the edge, is exactly equal to the length of the radius, then the angle that is formed is exactly equal to one radian. Right? So this theta is expressed as typically the arc length divided by the radius, whereby the arc length is exactly equal to the radius. And when that happens, it's exactly equal to 57.3 degrees. Right? So the distance around a circle that is ultimately made, this arc length, is typically expressed as an S. And it's only when this S is exactly equal to R that this angle, this angular component, is equal to one radian. That links to a very important concept of this ratio that was developed many, many uh, centuries ago called pi, whereby pi is the ratio of the circumference of a circle divided by the diameter of the circle, right? So the diameter is just the distance across that kind of dissects the circle in half. And in essence, the diameter is equal, equal to basically two times the length of the radius, right? So I could rewrite this as the circumference divided by two times r. Okay. So this ratio, this pi, is equal to 3.14 and a whole bunch of decimal places that no one's found the limit of yet or the end of it yet. But this ratio will always form. It will always be the same number regardless of the size of the circle. It can be a really, really small circle or it can be a really, really large circle. But whenever I take the circumference and divide it by the diameter or I take the circumference and divide it by two times the length of the radius, I will always get this number. And that's really powerful because often all I know is the radius. And if I know the radius, as long as I know the radius, I will be able to tell you exactly what the distance is that makes up the circumference of that circle. So without knowing that distance and only knowing the length of the radius, I can do some pretty powerful calculations. So if I was ultimately interested in just calculating what the circumference is, I could just rearrange this formula and multiply this 2r out over to that side, that tells me that the circumference of a circle is equal to 2 pi r. Right? In many instances, I might not be interested in calculating the whole distance around a circle. I might only be interested in calculating some component of it. So, for example, if I just wanted to move a half a circle instead of a full one, right? How far would that distance on the outside be? Well, if the full circle is 2 pi r, and if I divide that into two equal components, you'll see here that the 2s tend to cancel, and I'm just sitting with pi r. Well, what if I wanted to move a quarter circle? Right? What would this distance on the outside edge ultimately be? Well, if, again, 2 pi r is the full circle, and I divide it into four equal components, um, or one quarter, then you'll see that this would simplify to one half 
pi r. Or I could just write that as pi over 2 r. And what about a three-quarter circle? Right, so I walked three quarters around the edge of a full circle. What would that distance on the outside ultimately be? Well, 2 pi r is still the full thing. If I walked three quarters of it, then in essence the distance on the outside edge is 6 over 4 pi r, which simplifies to 3 over 2 pi r. Right, So all of a sudden, this relatively simple formula, I can start getting some really interesting information out of it. Right, The distances around the edge to which I walk has some link to all of this. So some pretty clever mathematicians realized that in this formula, if I wanted to determine what the distance around an outside edge is, I'll just call that distance on the outside edge S, the only thing that seems to be changing is this component of 2 pi, because the r is found in all of these uh, equations that we kind of just developed. But what does change is this pi factor, right? It's either pi if I move in half a circle, it's pi over 2 if I move in a quarter circle, it's 3 over 2 pi if I move 3 quarters of a circle. So I said, well, if this is a variable that tends to change, let's simplify it and call it theta. And r is still ever present, right? So this theta is measured in radians, right? This angular motion that is linked to pi. r is still r, it's just a radius that's measured in meters, right? And this s is just the distance around the edge, or what we call the arc length. So this is like a super important equation, so I'll just kind of box it because we'll need it quite a lot later. But you'll see that there must be some kind of link between this concept of a radian and degrees, right? And all of these, here I moved 180 degrees. Here I moved 90 degrees, and here I moved about 270 degrees, right? Yet I was always able to determine what that length was in terms of radians. So here we are just trying to establish what that link ultimately is. 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. So... How many radians is 1 degree? Well, if I divide both sides by 360, I'll be able to determine what that is. Anything divided by itself is equal to 1. So 1 degree is equal to 2 pi over 360 radians, which simplifies to pi over 180 radians. Okay. So if I have a certain number of degrees, it would give me exactly what the number of radians is. If I had to try and apply that to an example that we've already done, let's say for example 90 degrees. So if I just take this formula that we've just developed, if 1 degree is equal to pi over 180 radians, then if I multiply both sides by 90, 90 degrees would be equal to 90 times this conversion factor of pi over 180 radians, right? So 90 degrees, if I simplify this, 90 over 180 is a half. So this would equate to pi over 2 radians, right? Isn't that what I kind of got over here? Right? Pi over 2 radians. So this seems to work pretty well. What if I wanted to work from radians back to degrees. So if 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees, then how many degrees is 1 radian? So if I divide both sides by 2 pi, I should be able to calculate what that is. So that means 1 radian, remember anything divided by itself is equal to 1, is equal to 360 over 2 pi 
uh, degrees. And that simplifies to 180 over pi. So that's a conversion factor from radians to degrees. So let's say, let's see if I would get this same answer. If I wanted to find out how many degrees pi over 2 radians is, I would multiply that out is equal to uh, 180 over pi, that's my conversion factor, times pi over 2. And you would see that the pi is cancelled out and 180 over 2 is equal to 90 degrees. So that seems to work quite well in terms of conversion. So pi over 2 radians is equal to 90 degrees. That's what we've got here, 90 degrees equal to pi over 2 radians. So in your biomechanics manual, there'll be quite a few of these things to work through. Um, I won't go through any more examples because it's going to make the video quite long. There's just one or two more elements that I'd need to unpack. And then we'll move on to angular velocities. Okay. So you can see here that in a circle, if I start at some position, let me just redraw that for a sec. If I start at some position, and we'll just keep it straightforward for now. Um, let's say I started at some initial position and I moved 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians to some final position. Then I've undergone some kind of angular displacement. So I started here at some initial angular position and I ended up here at some final angular position. So this is equal to the change in angular position. So I could just write that, that the change in angular position is equal to some final minus some initial angular position. If I started here, let's say it was degrees, I started at zero and ended up at 90. My change in angular position is just expressed as 90 minus zero, which is equal to 90 degrees, right? The same as this would be two pi, and I ended up here at pi over two. So I could just rewrite this as pi over 2 minus 2 pi, which would give me pi over 2, right? So if I think about this, this is a half minus 1 gives me negative 1 half pi, right? But the direction of motion is really, really important in all of this, right? So it means by convention that angular motion is a vector quantity, right? So it's got this little arrow over it, meaning that if I move in a clockwise direction, typically that is ascribed a negative value. And if I move in a positive direction, that's given a... Uh, sorry, in a, an anti-clockwise direction is given a positive value, right? Okay, so I will leave it there for now, and we'll see how far we get working through some of those examples earlier on, and um, moving on to angular velocity in the next video. Thanks for watching.